Big AI news this week. Microsoft keeps betting more and more on AI. They recently launched their very own AI model that's in a league of its own. Not only that, but they're also reactivating the nuclear power plant responsible for the worst nuclear accident in US history, all so that they can power their AI needs. Should you be concerned? No, no. It makes for a really good headline, but it's actually not as bad as it sounds. Hit the thumbs up to show the YouTube algorithm that you're in charge. And let's get started. All right, so first and foremost, Microsoft is betting it big on AI. They, they have been for a while now, and they just continue to double down on it. So as you know, energy, electricity is seen as a big bottleneck for AI development, for training the models, for inference to a lesser degree. But overall, we need a lot of power to run and develop these models. Now, nuclear energy can produce a lot of energy. So nuclear fuel is extremely energy dense. One ton of coal produced the same amount of energy as 120 gallons of oil and the same amount of energy as one tiny uranium pellet, so one inch tall. So it's very energy dense compared to anything else we have. The comic XKCD, of course, does this extremely well, kind of shows this very well by showing basically how much energy you get per kilogram of, you know, various things, right? You have gasoline, fat, coal, sugar, right? And then there's uranium, which is just off the charts. The problem with nuclear energy, of course, is every once in a while we have an accident and things go very, very bad. So as you can see here, this is kind of like the buildup of active reactors. And we had an accident called Fukushima, which most people might remember, probably happened in their lifetimes. Before that, we had Chernobyl, which by the way, if you're bored and have HBO, the Chernobyl series on HBO was excellent. Really, really good. Insanely well done, I think. But before Fukushima and Chernobyl, we had Three Mile Island, a nuclear accident here in the United States. And there's a company called Constellation Energy, which is a publicly traded company. It's restarting the Unit 1 reactor at Three Mile Island. Now, the important thing to understand here is that the thing that went kablooey was Unit Reactor 2. So the point is TMI-2, the second reactor, was decommissioned. That's the thing that caused the radioactive gases to be released into the environment. And there's TMI-1, and that one operated until it's shut down in 2019. So that one's running just fine. And as far as I can tell, as far as I know, it has been all this time. So just be a little bit careful when you hear the headlines. It's not that there was some nuclear meltdown. So now Microsoft is coming in and just like, let's start it up again and see what happens. That That's not what's happening. So this company, this public trade company, Constellation Energy, it plans to restart the Three Mile Island nuclear plant and it's going to sell the power to Microsoft, seemingly exclusively. So, of course, Microsoft is looking for a lot of energy to run the data centers needed for AI. And it looks like Constellation Energy, the company that's putting this power plant back online, looks like it wants to put it back online in 2028, so just under four years from now. And when we're talking about Microsoft, like doubling down, just betting it big, so they've agreed to purchase this energy for, for 20 years. It's a 20-year agreement to match the energy its data centers consume with carbon-free power. The CEO of Constellation Energy is saying the decision here is the most powerful symbol of the rebirth of nuclear power as a clean and reliable energy source. So AI is almost like creating these incentives for us to bring back nuclear power. Microsoft also recently announced their brand new model called GRIN-MO, or I guess MOE, Mixture of Experts. And if you take a look at where this model is on this chart, the vertical axis, the y-axis, it's the performance, how well it does. Notice it's higher than anything else on this list, at least. And on the x-axis, we have activated parameters. So basically the size of it. So the more parameters you have, the sort of, we generally say the bigger the model is, but it also tends to be slower, tends to be more expensive. Smaller models are faster. They're cheaper to run. They're cheaper to train. They have a lot of advantages. They can even be installed on edge devices, on phones and thermostats and computers in your car, because you can have enough computer power there to, to run it on those edge devices. So as you can see here, while Grim MOE is not the smallest, it's definitely one of the smallest models on here, while at the same time being the best. What's the secret? Its abilities, how they were able to accomplish this, is explained in part in this paper. Grin, Gradient Informed MOE. For those that are not aware, MOE, Mixture of Experts, is one of the things that we think one of the big leaps you know, it wasn't a new idea. Google has published some research about it. But I think GPT-4 was the thing where people realized that it wasn't one giant model. It was a, actually a collection of experts, a mixture of experts, each with its own sort of area of expertise. So instead of thinking of something like GPT-4 as sort of this one big model, instead, when you ask it a question, it gets routed or gated to the appropriate sort of sub-model or expert. That expert answers the question, and that's what gets kind of routed back to you. And this is what Microsoft says here. They're saying this MOE model they scale more efficiently than dense models. So the, the big giant models where it's like all in one, but there are issues with how we train these models. 
And this is sort of an approach in architecture to make the training better for specifically mixture of experts models. And so this model that they made, it's 16 experts by 3.8 billion parameters. So with 6.6 .6 billion activated parameters, so the effective sort of model size, this model outperforms a 7 billion model that's, you know, the dense model, the one big chunk model. And it matches the performance of a 14 billion dense model trained on the same data. So apples to apples, this thing is half the size without giving up any performance. And they're seeing the extensive evaluations of this approach across a lot of different tasks, which shows that there's potential for this GRIN approach, right, to significantly enhance the mixtures of experts' efficacy, its ability to get stuff done. And you can see that here. It's, again, one of the smallest models listed here, right? So anything kind of above this line in this direction to the right of it is bigger. And as you can see here, normally, I mean, you can kind of see as, as the models get bigger, they get better, right? There's not too many things over here. There's no point making bigger models that are not as effective, not as well performing, right? So the bigger they are in general, the better they are. This Grin MOE really stands out because it's one of the smallest models, but also the best, at least again, for this particular sort of comparison. Why is it important? Well, for memory and compute constraint environments, so places where you just don't have massive horsepower to run it, like on your phone, for example, or in your car. Latency bound scenario, so some where you need the answer fast, where you need to perform very, very quickly. And it shows strong reasoning, especially code, math, and logic. And so right now, if you're kind of not aware, there's a lot of people that are debating and considering how much will coding change over the next several years as AI keeps getting better and better at coding. Some people think it might completely replace software engineers. I think most people that are the kind of AI insiders that are running these companies, Jensen Huang, the CEO of AWS, Amazon's cloud services, and, and a lot of other people are saying, well, it's not going to replace them, but it, it, it is really going to change in how we do software development, software engineering, because AI is going to do a lot of the grunt work. And so the engineers will kind of get lifted to more higher tasks, more like overseers and, and planning, kind of putting it all together. I did this video about this very topic that we're talking about right now, and this person, uh, uh, internal cold 14 great comment said in response to your thumbnail the end of software engineers which was that was like the quote that was kind of floating around i used it in a title because that was kind of like the language that was being used and so this person pointed out wouldn't this be the rise of the software engineer and the end of the programmer. So, I mean, that sparked a, a bit of a debate, which is very interesting uh, of what exactly kind of those roles were, were, will shift to and what are we going to call it, coding, software engineering, et cetera. But one thing is apparent is a lot of these companies are really, really interested in developing these AI tools that can code. These people spend billions and billions of dollars on various software developers. If the AI tools can help them offset some of that cost, of course, that's very appealing to them. Even if it doesn't necessarily offset the cost, but improves the efficiency, it's still extremely, extremely appealing. It's a very big, juicy target to hit if you have the best AI tool that either A, may, you know, turns most you know, software engineers or whatever word you want to use for that turns them into just rock star engineers, whether it does that or, or, or it eliminates the need for half of your software engineers, like either way, that's a big, big deal. It would be extremely lucrative to be the owner of that, you know, AI tool. And so as we're looking at some of these benchmarks for how well AI tools can code. So for example, one is human eval, right? This is kind of the chart over time. So this is pass at one. So meaning that the AI tool just gets one chance to get it right versus, you know, generating 10 different samples, 10 different results and picking one of them. That would be like pass at 10. There's also pass at 100. Like this is pass at one. So you, you ask it for one answer and then you test that answer, right? So in, you know, before September, 2021, the best thing we had looks like had 32.2 accuracy on this human eval benchmark. So 32, let's say just for simplicity. And then a year later, we had code Da Vinci at 65.8, a modified GPT-4 at 85. And it looks like now we have ones that clock in at 99.39, Agent Coder at 96.3, Cloud 3.5 Sonnet at 92. Here's GPT-4.0. So one of the latest models, the 01, which was the, the very recent release, we expect that to be even better but it probably hasn't, it looks like we don't have that available yet, the results, but so GPT-4.0 is 90.2, right? And so this is the, the human eval benchmark across many different models. The leftmost one is the one we're talking about, Grin MOE, this, this tiny model, this 6.6 .6 billion model. For comparison, we believe that uh, GPT-4, the number that they said it was 1.7 trillion. Now we don't know if that's an apples to apples comparison because here, you know, they we know the architecture exactly of GPT-4. Oh, we don't. But the point is, you know, on this human eval, Grin MOE is at 74.4. So again, in let's say September 2022, the best model 
for this particular benchmark, right? Clocked in at 65 and it was 175 billion parameters big. This new one is at 74 at less than 7 billion parameters. There's also apparently something called the AGI eval, right? So a human centric benchmark for evaluating foundation models. This is kind of like testing the top models like GPT-4, right? Comparing them to where humans are right here. They're saying impressively GPT-4 surpasses average human performance on SATs, LSATs and math competitions, etc. Right? So this sort of a dark blue area, that's the average human performance on these various areas uh, that, that are being tested on. The more or like the outside one, the lighter blue cyan color, I would maybe, right? Some people really know their colors. They're like, is it navy blue or aquamarine? To me, it's, no, it's blue. It's just blue. Light blue, dark blue, and blue. So there's a lighter blue that's at the outside. That's the top human performance. And so you see GPT-4 here kind of in this yellow. So it's uh, overall a little bit kind of similar to, you know, the average human performance, but it, it, not in the same ways. Like it's shifted a little bit. But in terms of like just area covered, it's, it's it's similar to the average human performance, just sorts. It's, it's, it's excels in different areas, is a little bit worse in, in certain areas. But according to this chart, so GPT-4.0 on that AGI eval, it did 37.6%. Gemini 1.5 Flash did 45. Looks like GPT-3.5 did 48. Surprisingly, did really well. But Microsoft's new model, the tiny 6.6 .6 billion parameter model, did 48.2, right? And again, if you look here at the averages across all of them, right? So it's, it's you know, if you round up, it's 80, right? It's just under 80. There's only a few here that I can see that are higher. It stacks up really, really well against all the other models, even though it's tiny in size, much, much smaller. So the point is, I think it's safe to say that these models will get better at reasoning, at coding, at math. There's going to be ones that are extremely good, that are open source, that can run on, you know, your, your at-home devices. It will be very easy to run multiple versions and agents of these kind of working together, putting stuff together, which is has been shown to really improve their abilities. So if you fast forward five years, you know, and let's say we have all those sort of improvements, improve, you know, the algorithmic improvements, the improvements in model architecture, people learning how to use and put these things together, you know, it's going to be acing these coding benchmarks you know does that mean that it replaces a smart software engineer with experience with you know experience working in teams and kind of that the planning abilities kind of visualizing everything and seeing how everything fits together and then being able to correct errors and stuff like that i don't know i think that's still up for debate there are people that make very strong arguments why that will not be the case and certainly we haven't seen anything that proves them wrong yet but i think it is obvious now that how we do things will be changing how we approach coding what work will be done by AI? What work will be done strictly by humans? Kind of like what, what does that labor division look like? I think for sure that will be changing over time, changing rapidly. But certainly I think that if you take two equally talented software engineers, you know, all else being equal, the one with the stronger AI knowledge and ability and the person that can kind of like manage AI better, that's the person that's going to be a better software engineer. Again, all things being equal, if you can run a perfect kind of A-B test, split test, right? Like clone somebody perfectly, right? They, they have the same knowledge, the same intelligence, the same work ethic, right? And if one of them took the time to really figure these tools out, kind of like stayed ahead of the curve, while the other one, you know, just decided to rewatch the Silicon Valley show during that same time, the one that learned to use the AI tools would probably win. I hope that didn't hit too close to home. I'm not judging you. I'm, I'm rewatching it myself. I have almost 300 hours logged in BattleBit Remastered, so I'm not here to judge anybody. Have you ever said a word so many times that it lost all meaning? Want to see it happen in real time? Another news, Chipotle. Another news, Chipotle. 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 Chipotle introduces robots to help make the bowls, uh, and they're calling it avocado. There's this thing called semantic saturation. That's like when you say a word so many times that it loses all meaning. Has that ever happened to you? Like you say door 50 times and you're like, door? And just your brain no longer kind of like links that word. I think I said chipotle, chipotle so many times that it's, I'm no longer sure if that's even a word or if I'm saying it right, but whatever it's called, I, I love their food. I really enjoy the barbacoa bowls with the guac and the sour cream. And it, it, it's excellent for those of you that are fortunate enough to have been to one of those there. Phenomenal. So expect more and more of these uh, robotic devices that are going to be rolling out to the various restaurants across the country. I think Chipotle is just the, the first of its kind. Chipotle. 
Okay, next we have T-Mobile. So T-Mobile and OpenAI joined forces. So they had a whole little fireside chat, which just did not get too much attention. It was like a two hour long session of them talking about stuff and announcing stuff. It was just kind of, I mean, T-Mobile isn't as exciting to watch what they're talking about as, you know, like when Apple does an event, everybody watches that. Even Google, Nvidia, like a lot more eyes on that. T-Mobile, not so much, but halfway through it, a wild Sam Altman appears and uh, talks a little bit about O1 and kind of where he sees it going, which I think is kind of like one of the first times he really kind of spoke at length about the O1, the new OpenAI model, and what it really means. So here's a quick clip kind of condensing what I think his, his point was from the T-Mobile Farsa chat with Sam Altman. I have to congratulate you on the O1 models Thank and you. the preview happening. And maybe you could get this audience sort of settled by telling us what the new stuff is all about, because it's pretty amazing. Yeah, we're, we're extremely excited for this. We've been working on it for a long time. Um, the, the GPT series of models was amazing at sort of system one type thinking, for lack of a more nuanced word. But we knew what we really wanted was systems that could reason. And there's so much value if you can have AI that can reason through more complex problems. You saw a glimpse of that with the GPT-4 models. But O1 really is the first system that can do pretty advanced reasoning. Um, you know, if you give it a difficult programming challenge or a difficult math problem, a difficult science thing you need help with, uh, you can really get pretty extraordinary results. And we believe this is going to unlock, uh, over time, this will look as significant as the GPT series and unlock a huge set of new, very, very valuable use cases. So um, you publicly said that what we're seeing is a preview and it's yeah. going to be rapidly iterated. How's it all going to unfold over the next few months? I think of this as like a, we're at the GPT-2 stage of these new kind of reasoning models. And uh, you will see it over the coming years go up to the GPT-4 equivalent. Um, but even in the coming months, you'll see it get a lot better as we move from O1 preview to O1 which we shared uh, some metrics for in our launch blog post, uh, it's a very significant step forward. And I think one of the many fun things about these moments of new paradigms is that the curve, the improvement curve is really steep. And so, uh, I, you know, things that the models can't solve right now, in a few months they'll be able to solve, a few months after that be able to solve even more. And, and most importantly, uh, well, I don't know about most importantly, importantly, I think we're going to see a whole new set of ways to use these models. When, when we had GPT 3.5, um, it was in the API for a while, and then it was really the chat GPT moment that made people use it a lot. And even then, it took people a while to figure out how to use chat GPT, and it took us a while to build all the other features and add the things that people wanted. Um, so I think we're that early with O1. There will be totally new ways to use it that are not just a chat interface. Uh, it'll take us a while to build those and other people a while to build those. It'll also take users a while to figure out how to use it. And this is pretty different than the GPT models. Um, we have these five levels of AI we talk about. Uh, the first was chatbots. The second, which we've just reached now, is reasoners. Uh, the third is agents. The fourth is sort of innovators, the ability to figure out new scientific information. And the fifth is full organizations. Um, so this move from one to two took a while, but I think the most exciting, one of the most exciting things about two is that it enables level three relatively quickly after. And the agentic experiences that we expect this technology to eventually enable, I think will be quite impactful. Well, that's it for me. My name is Wes Roth. If you made this far, thank you so much. You're a trooper. Consider subscribing, giving a thumbs up a hit to train the YouTube algorithm to respect you and uh, continue providing you with the best content possible. With that said, thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.